Great. Uh, I think we're going to get started. Will was telling me that I have to speak loudly, and I come from a family of six, so I speak loudly. So this is Kubeflow in the financial sector. We really do appreciate everybody coming and joining us here today, along with myself, Josh Bottom, uh, from Ericto. I'm also a Kubeflow community product manager. I have Laura Shornack from J.P. Morgan Chase, uh, and Jeff Fogarty from U.S. Bank, and Taya Lam Lampkin from Google. So um, one of the things, I'm just going to give a brief introduction about what we're doing in the community, as well as some of the things that we've been seeing and how we're helping the, the fintech organizations move along. One of the uh, now, um, kind of themes that we came up with at the Kubeflow Summit that was held last month at Google, uh, where all the Kubeflow contributors came together and, and many of the users, was to use this uh, summit analogy of climbing a mountain. And if all of you are familiar with climbing a mountain, you can't just go from the bottom to the top, right? You have to usually come up to a base camp one, acclimate before you go up to the, to the next phase or the next base camp. And we use this analogy in two different ways, both for users and for contributors. So when I look at the experience of a lot of the users that are in working with Kubeflow, we typically see an architect show up and maybe an ML engineer and then a data scientist. But then the team gets a little bit bigger, maybe a data engineer shows up, and then a product manager and an end user. Typically, you need kind of that uh, group of folks organized in a cohesive manner to really start to see the values of, of Kubeflow. So that's one piece of getting to the summit is not just getting your architect or your ML engineers up there. You need to bring the, best, the rest of your team. The other part is from the contributors uh, do it, actually providing the pieces of Kubeflow. So Kubeflow is composable. There's a lot of different pieces. Some of them are in different stages of maturity. So you'll see as we go towards Kubeflow 1.0, which is really our eighth release of Kubeflow, which will be in the first quarter of next year, several of the pieces, the notebooks, the KF Cuddle, the, uh, the operators for training, the ML operators, all of those have been mature and around for quite some time, and many of the other pieces are starting to mature. They're either in beta phase or going towards 1.0. We're lucky because we have Michelle uh, here who actually designed our application review, our design spec for 1.0. So that's been a community effort to get to a 1.0 definition for the, the pieces of Kubeflow. So it's a journey, right, that's been over three years in the making. And another piece that I think is interesting of having a community is looking at the early uh, investors into ML and in, into Kubeflow and how algorithmic uh, innovation has changed so many of the businesses that are out there. This book, The Four, it's one of the things that I got from my daughter's education at SMU. She gave it to me, one of her professors gave it to her. I don't know if she read it, but uh, it was marked up a little bit. But it was interesting. There's a lot of statistics in it. It's a decent read. One of the statistics was comparing the market cap per employee of General Motors to Facebook. And General Motors has a very nice uh, market cap per employee, it's $300,000, but Facebook's almost 40 times more at $12 million per employee. You may say, well, so what? They're in different businesses. They're both competing for money, right? And so when you look at what uh, machine learning actually is doing in this book, and he talks about in the four, the hidden DNA of the, the four companies that are listed there, is that machine learning increases productivity, it increases margin, revenue, and market cap, right? And if you look at the, the kind of the early adopters behind Apple and Facebook and, and Google um, and Amazon, you'll see that folks like LinkedIn that came in and spoke to the community uh, in March of, of last year, talking about their Kubeflow experience and their visionary view of they were building ML on their own, they were building a platform on their own, then they looked around and said, hey, this is really hard, maybe I want to join a community, and they did, and they started to see the benefits over the year that they, that they started from 2017, the end of 17, to 18, they actually came back to the community and said, hey, this was what our vision is, and this is what we're working from. 
If you guys know how hard it is to get an ML engineer, that's one thing. The other thing is they cost a lot. So doubling their productivity is a good thing. The other is a lot of you have probably seen Spotify's presentation. They did this at the Qflow 7 Summit. I thought it was very impressive that 70% of their models get productized within 12 weeks. The fact that they can do that, actually get them productized, but also track it, I thought was impressive. And then just to circle back to General Motors. General Motors in 2016 bought a self-driving startup company called Cruise Automation. They presented here for a billion dollars. I thought that was a lot of money. This year, Cruise Automation was valued at $19 billion. Okay, so I haven't met a, uh, you know, uh, an engineer yet that doesn't want to be part of a, a unicorn or a startup. You know, th this type of thing where you're seeing this type of value increase is just remarkable. And I read on Motley Fool that cruise automation might be worth $40 billion. It's incredible because GM's total valuation is only $52 billion. Anyway, we've all heard that software may be the new uh, oil. I would say that machine learning software is the new gasoline. It's refined in a premium value of oil that's worth more money. So why is Kubeflow coming to a fintech near you? Well, first, building and maintaining an ML stack is hard, right? There's a lot of documentation to that. And the growth of Kubeflow is following other successful, let's call mountain climbs, right? Kubernetes and TensorFlow. And leveraging a community gives you a good uh, options from support, but it also allows you to attract the best and brightest, to bring their work with them in the open source community. And finally, you see the financial leaders already there at the Kubeflow Summit sharing their stories, right? Whether it's Bloomberg or Intuit or JP Morgan, Visa uh, or Ant, we're seeing a lot of good inter interaction from a community standpoint. And to that point, we're seeing this growth both in the number of PRs that are being issued as well as the individual contributors, but specifically from contributions from the fintech area, you'll see Bloomberg is doing a tremendous job. Dan Sun has done so many, so much on this in building KF serving with Ellis from, from Google. And you'll also see folks from Gojek uh, who are doing and contributing the Feast, uh, which is the feature store, which is probably a second level of where more sophisticated uh, Kubeflow users will be understanding how Feast fits in. And then with Ant, they did a good presentation comparing running XG Boost uh, on Kubeflow versus Spark. Uh, these type of stories, this type of collaboration, I think is, is just fantastic in helping uh, all folks that use Kubeflow. And then what we're also seeing is that these, contribu uh, these contributors are actually following kind of that same Kubernetes space where we're seeing other people besides uh, Google being more dominant now in the, in the amount of contributions that are happening. This includes the folks in the, uh, in the financial sector. But implementing Kubeflow in the, in the FinTech is not easy, right? Because high security often doesn't equal rapid innovation. So if you're talking about things about firewalls or proxy or authentication or even authorization, right, sandboxing, air gap, being able to get to certain data sets, being able to move data sets from on-prem to, to the cloud, uh, very difficult. B having root access, uh, being able to do valid, uh, secure container um, scans as well as build them from scratch are some of the things that we've heard. And then, but what we do see is in almost all sectors, and especially in the, uh, the FinTech, is that a ML platform for self-service for the data scientist does equal some form of rapid innovation. So being able to deploy secure notebooks and data sets with isolation tends to be a requirement. Shared ACL protected versions of models and data sets. So I want to be able to share it across two different uh, clouds or share it with various different teams. And then building pipelines without having to know Kubernetes and not having to, to build YAML files or run kubectl commands and not having to learn the pipeline DSLs uh, to be able to build, train, and deploy a, 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 a ML pipeline tends to be things that we're hearing. One of the pieces is, like you're like, who's Ericto, right? We know these other three, but why is Ericto here? So we're a leading Kubeflow contributor. So we 
nimbly are able to, to either do feature development, configuration, or work for, with folks, because right out of the box, Kubeflow probably is not going to work right for you. Right? And we provide a consistent local disk architecture, local disk architecture that simplifies operations. So what, is, what are some of the things that we provide in that simplification? We simplify, if you're familiar with running on local disk, is the first the setup of, uh, and then the ability to have provisioning, uh, and then durability and portability. So first, from setup, we help you set up the local node that prepares all those local disks. We also give you the ability to create a storage class that can be used by the container storage interface. The second part, from uh, we provide dynamic local uh, local disk, uh, or excuse me, dynamic persistent volume provisioning. You might say that's a lot of words. But actually, it's really good for the end user because they can get a local, they can get a persistent volume very easily on their own. It's dynamically provisioned by the, by the end user. The last uh, two pieces, being able to have durability, is the ability to take a snapshot of your local disk and put that volume onto an object store and have that be content addressable. And what that also provides you is portability, which means that I can pull up a clone of that snapshot and run it on any node in any cluster that's running our daemon set. So all of these basic um, primitives really do impact the ability to run ML pipelines and make those workflows faster. And just to give you an example of what we did in six months, this is the TFX example. One of them is called the Chicago Taxi Cab. To run this on-prem about a year ago took 26 steps, right? And 14 of them required coop cut all and YAML files. So basically, you had to have a data scientist wait for an ML engineer to do some of the work in order to get that pipeline to build, train, and deploy. So in, in, in less than six months, in Kubeflow 0.6, we cut that down to 12 steps, zero steps with any type of Kubernetes expertise required. So basically, a data scientist could do this on their own. So this type of productivity enhancement, this is just one of the many examples that we have. We're even doing more as we go towards 1.0. With, with that, uh, I think we're about ready for the next speaker, which is Laura Schoenack from J.P. Morgan Chase. Thank you. Here, I guess I'll say over here. Yeah. Hello. Good. Hi, I'm Laura Shornack, and I am the commercial bank architect uh, for Shared Services. And today I want to share a story with you about my team's journey of bringing Kubeflow to, uh, you know, to Chase with the help of Josh and his team. Like all interesting stories, this started with a team that had a problem. And what was our problem? We noticed in our Agile team that our machine learning stories had a much longer duration than our other stories, like our Python stories or our, our Java stories. And because we were all on the same team, we could easily make this comparison. Why does it take so much longer to deliver a machine learning model within the same team for the same, uh, you know, for the same application. And we realized it was because we didn't have a common tool set. We didn't have the same sophistication of tool set and process that we had for Java, for Python, for Angular. This started a partnership between our team and the engineering team. We went to the engineering team and asked them for a better tool set. And uh, this, this uh, resulted in two really great uh, outcomes. One, our, our indoor skydiving trip. And two, at the, end of, uh, at the end of our POC, we were able to have the same sort of flow that we had with, uh, with our other tooling. How did we get here? How did we get to Kubeflow? Why not just stick with Kubernetes? We already had Kubernetes. Kubernetes is uh, you know, just for orchestration of clusters. It doesn't, it doesn't help you with the orchestration of machine learning. It does let you run up a bunch of uh, instances and you can throw more computing power at your problem, but it doesn't automatically know what type of instances you need and when to shut them down. And you do not want to leave expensive GPU running when you don't need it. If that hits your cost center, people get upset. 
So, uh, and we also didn't have uh, any luck with data sharing in a, in a very uh, easy automated way, data transferring and security. With Kubernetes, everything starts open. The notebooks start open, the models start open, the network uh, traffic is unencrypted by default, and this is a problem. Any security problems are showstoppers for a FinTech or any environment that, is, uh, that has confidential data. Our first attempt at installing Kubeflow was with our internal cloud. Our internal cloud uh, had a couple, uh, a couple issues when we tried to bring Kubeflow on, and so with the help of Aricto, we, we stepped through all these issues, we recorded them, and, and we learned a little bit each time. Our first issue that we encountered was our, our internal Docker repo that we have because we need to scan everything, we're a bank, we need to make sure that everything is approved before we put it out in production. Uh, is, is different uh, in its hierarchy and different in the types of versions that it has, and that, uh, that didn't work well for our installs. Our Kubernetes uh, Im implementation didn't allow us to run as root. We could not run Kubeflow as root, and the containers were having, by default, uh, you know, issues with communicating between each other. And then, uh, you know, and then also, to do the install itself, we didn't have admin access. I, you know, I tried to get admin access to the cloud. For some reason, they decided not to give me admin access to the cloud. I would have given me admin access. I don't know why they didn't. And, uh, and we could not pull from repositories that were outside of our firewall, because that's another no-no. Those are, are unscanned. So we abandoned our first attempt and started to work with our external cloud. We took an AMI, an Amazon machine instance from Arikto, which uh, was very great. It started up easily, and it, uh, and it ran, but we were not able to connect to it. We kept trying to, to connect, but we were getting burnt by our internet proxy when we went from internal on-prem developer desktops out to our firewall. And uh, we even tried sending, you know, insecure uh, traffic as secure, but of course that didn't work, and we really wanted this to work. So we abandoned the AMI briefly and tried to do a brand new install, hoping that maybe the AMI was the issue. We used System Manager, we did a brand new uh, install on a, a bare metal EC2, and uh, we ran Vagrant, but we kept getting virtual errors, vert D errors. So our, our bare metal instance wasn't really bare metal after all, and you can't have a virtual on top of a virtual, so this, this also failed. Bringing us back to our AMI. At this point, we had to make this work. How can we connect? We know we can connect from our internal uh, developer desktops to our, our data center. We can connect to a simple Python server. So if we, if we generate the AMI in the same way with those same EC2 uh, network settings, we should be able to connect. We changed our, our, uh, the way we connect by, instead of using IP address, using the uh, external DNS. We use certificates, stop trying to send insecure traffic as secure. And uh, we, uh, you know, we use port forwarding from the desktop, as well as, uh, you know, as well as using the token that was generated at install. And so now we can connect, we can, we can use what we, we put out there. And there were a lot of, uh, a lot of really great features. As Josh was uh, talking about, one of the best features is that you can cut out 40% of your coding. Any coding that's not ML coding that just deals with the pipeline can be done with a click of a button. So you can have your ML engineers not have, any, uh, you know, not have any realization of what's going on in the background. They don't have to write pipeline code anymore. This saves you about 40%. And they don't have to deal with domain-specific languages, no knowledge of, of Kubeflow in the background. So this is a, a, big, a big plus. And also, it can take data, different versions of data's uh, models and uh, pipelines and push them in uh, to whatever instance you want. Which brings me to my favorite feature, storage. This journey started with us wanting to have a better developer experience, a better CI CD experience. To have this, you have to have versioning, not just versioning of data, but of your models and of your, your snapshots. When you can do this, when you can take everything that you've done in your dev environment, version it, and then put it back up in, de uh, put it back up in integration, put it back up in prod, then you have a true CI CD experience which is what we were looking for. I hope you enjoyed our story, and now let's get Jeff Fogarty's uh, perspective from U.S. Bank. Thank you. Thank you very much. 
Thank you, Laura. So the software journey for Kubeflow is really no different than any other software project within the enterprise. We have the same cast of characters. We have requirements and features, operational expectation and goals. Now we've decided to run on-prem and then like you know, Laura was saying, is it gonna be quote, bare metal or is it gonna be really bare metal? And then with the, with the Kubeflow community, there's a great benefit because there's so much knowledge out there, so much people, so many people are, are able and willing to help with questions and uh, anytime you get stuck. So one of the main goals of Kubeflow is to increase productivity of the data scientist. And providing a self-service platform is a key to this productivity gain. A more recent goal that I've heard articulated is to provide a platform where models can be processed reproducibly. Now, with, this, with the caveat that the data scientists should not be experts in Kubernetes. So as I mentioned, that this self-service platform is a main goal. But to achieve this goal, these notebook servers and these pipelines need to be isolated. So, but Kubernetes doesn't provide this out of the box. But what Kubernetes does provide is a building blocks where you can have a higher level of abstraction. So if you see this, this slide we have here, we have James and Sarah both logging in. So they log in via uh, the Istio gateway, DEX in the OIDC auth service. And they're presented, they're given a, either their own namespace or a shared namespace. And it's in these namespaces that they can perform their work. So let's take a look at the architecture. <clears throat> so again, we have this ingress that I just mentioned. And then we have all these namespaces where this process happened. You have the notebooks, and then the pipelines, and eventually we'll have all of these, the, the community will have all of these uh, in their own namespace. But from an on-prem perspective, there's something missing, and that's storage. Now, don't underestimate storage as an uh, issue on your on-prem installation. As Laura mentioned, it's, it, is, it becomes more and more important. So, Now, my journey with Kubeflow started with version 0 0.3. And it took me like at least a week to get it to install the first time, or probably more than that. So we started with various uh, options of storage with limited su success. And then the community evolved, it matured. And then I found out about Ericto and that what they had to provide for uh, storage, and that sounded very appealing because, you know, these snapshots, um, to be able to keep that data around, that, that image around. Now, in a, in a regulator environment, we always have the issue of lawsuits, and it's not if a lawsuit happens, it's when they happen. And we gotta be able to reproduce all that. So how are we gonna do it unless you, keep, you don't keep the data? So the, the, the Ericto software provides these snapshots, provide versionings. So what's all the next steps that I see uh, we need to explore? So archiving of storage, not just code models, but the, also the data. So it's, if you keep all, the, all that, those snapshots on your production, quote production, uh, Kubeflow environment, that's kind of expensive. You're, you're taking up resources that could be used for more processing. So you know, how can we move that off to another environment and how do we get that back? Understanding that is something that, we need, that I see we need to explore. So the, <clears throat> also we have the uh, Kubeflow to, to be able to build reproducible pipelines, patterns for pipelines and then use these patterns for fast following teams. 
And then again, like, like uh, Josh was mentioning, all the new things that are coming out. We have that feast that he mentioned. It looks very, very interesting. Uh, the Kubeflow components, like KF serving, is going to be something that, that we need to experiment with. So with that, I'd like to introduce Taya Lampkin from Google. Thanks, Jeff. Do you have your own? Uh, do we have two uh, handhelds? Yeah. OK, great. Hi, I'm Taya Lampkin. Um, I am an open source strategist at Google. And one of the projects that I work with um, is Kubeflow. Um, and I've been kind of working with the Kubeflow to community to make sure that the way we do open development um, really incorporates all of the user feedback that we're hearing, um, that c individual contributors are hearing from the clients they work with on the ground. Um, so Ericto is a really fantastic example of that working very well um, and having you know Josh uh, represented on our product management working group is an excellent way to get um, you know, user feedback directly from the FinTech customers he works with um, to inform the product development and priorities as we build each release. Um, and so I, I'm here basically to kind of use some of the user survey da data that we collected as a uh, kind of experiment through the product management working group um, to facilitate some extra conversations around how we're seeing early people using Kubeflow today and how that tracks with the FinTech experiences that both uh, Laura and Jeff represent. Um, and so just a little bit of background on uh, the community surveys we've been running. Uh, we started this as like, okay, we have a lot of early users of Kubeflow. They're kind of using every uh, Kubeflow in many different ways. Um, back in 0 0.5, when we were starting to work on that, we wanted to have a kind of reliable way to um, set priorities across the various work streams. Um, one of the ways we work in the Kubeflow community is we first start by defining some of our core customer user journeys, um, so CUJ that we leverage to get feedback from different com contributors who have experience with different sets of end, us end users who um, represent in different industries, um, different environments, um, and people with you know, different levels of security requirements. Um, and so once we kind of solidify a course UJ that most of the community agrees on, <laughs> then we use it to build out some more detailed design um, design documents um, and organize ourselves into work streams on GitHub Kanban boards. Um, so as we were looking, uh, the first couple of surveys we found were really informative. Um, and then as we got to 1.0, uh, we wanted to build um, kind of the the most uh, deep survey um, representing like very specific technical questions that we wanted to inform some of uh, the product decisions we were making um, as we thought about what's the most important uh, feature functionality to deliver in 0 0.7 as our beta for 1.0. And here, I'm excited to share the results um, from some of these responses we got. I think we had about 75 respondents to the survey, um, and a vast majority of those were already using Kubeflow. So um, one, this slide represents um, a, a question we had that is kind of at the forefront of our community discussions, who really is using Kubeflow from a role perspective? Um, and as you see, we have like the data science and the ML engineer emerging as the two main um, users of Kubeflow, which presents an interesting uh, quandary for us. Like who really are we optimizing for when we think about user experience in Kubeflow? Um, so I'd love to get perspectives from Laura and Jeff on like what roles um, have the most exposure to Kubeflow on their teams um, and who they see as like the kind of most important customer for Kubeflow. I agree with these results. Can you hear me? I agree with these results. I, I agree that uh, the data, the, the ML engineer is probably the first person you need to make happy. They're the person that's trying out the POCs, bringing Qflow on-prem, and uh, working out all the bugs to, to get your initial adoption. Yeah, I see the same. I, I think when the, uh, as the environment matures and people get more comfortable using Kubeflow, I think some of these might change. Some of these might flop around. You may see more data scientists. And it also depends on the industry, too. So, But yeah, I, I could, especially in, the, in my experience, that the ML engineers would be the most ones using Kubeflow. 
Great. Um, and, and do you feel like you have an understanding of uh, how much the individual roles will like be exposed to Kubeflow and their day-to-day -day workflows? Like, is it you know an ML engineer that's really defining how the organization works with Kubeflow, but then the data scientists are the users who spend most um, most time interacting with the SDKs and UI? Or yeah, I would I would agree with that. I guess I mean the for a data scientist, my goal is would that they would not really care if it's Kubeflow. It's they just want something to get their work done. I mean that's that's the biggest hope is. Yeah. I agree with Jeff. You want to abstract it as much as possible so that the data scientist doesn't have to understand that they're coding to Kubeflow. And I think that uh, Point 0.7 has done a much better job, and we're looking forward to seeing 1.0. Awesome. Thanks. That's super helpful. Um, so another slide uh, here represents one of the questions that was most interesting to us um, on uh, how people are using Kubeflow. So this is a breakdown of how uh, which uh, components uh, were used for survey respondents. Um, and what was most notable for me here was that pipelines, um, no surprise to us that pipelines is one of the most uh, popular components in Kubeflow. Um, also, we see notebooks um, being very popular um, with you know a, a little bit of an even spread across serving, which is pretty new, um, and hyperparameter tuning and metadata. Um, does this track with the usage that you see on your teams? I definitely agree with this, except for I think hyperparameter usage is something we're very excited to see. And uh, as soon as that comes out, I know everyone's going to be very excited about it. Yeah, and also with that, the feast, the, uh, the feature store, that's something that's going to be pretty popular, I think, across a lot of industries. So with more, with more features coming out, these, these will change, I believe. Yeah, just a, a note that um, I've, I've, you know, experienced in my conversations with people, a lot of people see pipelines as one of the access points to many of the other components within Kubeflow. Um, so it's not surprising that they're also <laughs> the most used components. Um, and this is a great slide. Um, we put together a mishmash of four different questions that I thought were getting at the same like set of uh, you know, usage patterns that we wanted to explore. Um, so this is looking at the infrastructure um, and environments people are using Kubeflow um, within. And also, like, are they running Kubeflow on CPUs or GPUs? Um, are they using Istio? Um, and who are they using for identity providers? So first, from a, from a environment standpoint, on-premise Kubeflow is very uh, exciting to people. I'm sure that Laura and Jeff, you know, heartily agree with that. Um, do you think that on-premise uh, Kubeflow delivers more value than in other environments? For FinTech, definitely on-prem is very important. We have a lot of security concerns. And as far as uh, GPU versus, uh, you know, as opposed to other usage, the first question we're always asked is, can I get GPU? Can this, can this make me go faster? And the second question is around security. I think the first, the first question should be around security, though. Yeah, what she said. No, but <clears throat> it's uh, on-prem. Uh, on-prem won't go away, in my opinion. I mean, I think that th everybody wants to jump to the cloud, but uh, on-prem is here, still here to stay, in my opinion. Yeah, and how do you see the tight integration with Istio um, in Kubeflow working for you? I uh, I think that uh, I think Istio is very tightly woven in, and we're you know I don't see them separating. Yeah, I, yeah. I agree with that. Uh, again, it, once we get more mature, we're going to have more experience, especially with Istio. It, right now, it seems to be a black box for us. Okay. Um, and then, so the last point on this slide is identity providers. Um, it was really interesting to see us uh, see that split across GitHub and LDAP for identity providers. I think we were pretty surprised to see so many people responding that GitHub was their identity provider. But I think that um, kind of segues nicely to this next slide where we see um, some of the key adoption blockers reported um, from respondents who broke down to either like self-identifying as an enterprise user versus, dis versus a disruptor user, which we'd see as our like kind of large startups. Um, and the disruptors also tended to track much more closely to GitHub usage uh, for, um, for their identity provider. Um, which of these blockers do you feel like you uh, experience most strongly um, across uh, 
immature release date, documentation, lack of understanding, um, and something else, our, our back being probably most interesting for you guys. So security and installation have been uh, blockers for us initially. And, uh, and as far as uh, security, we're finding that this integrates well with what we have. And as far as uh, installation, once you get over that initial hump, then I don't see why uh, we should have any blockers after that. Each release gets better and better, right? Yeah, the, <clears throat> the deployment, yeah. So I started with, like I mentioned, I started with 0 0.3, and that was extremely painful. But it's expected because it's open source and it's really, really, really new. Um, so I, I accepted that. It was a, I'm an innovation team and that's what we do. Uh, I think the, the education piece is, is pretty important too. It's why do, we, why do I want to use Kubeflow from a, from a, a business line perspective? Why do I want to use Kubeflow is what I hear a lot. Awesome. Thanks. Um, and thanks for joining us here today. Um, I encourage you to try out the 0 0.7 release, which um, if you judge Laura and Jeff's comments should be a lot more of an easy starting experience for you than some of the previous versions. Um, we're also kind of looking at this as our beta for 1.0, um, where we're gonna have, you know, be solidifying some of our um, APIs and also um, getting all of our up, uh, updated documentation in place um, for this to be, you know, a little bit more accessible for the enterprise and production environments. Um, so encourage you to try it out, file bugs, and also thank you so much, Laura and Jeff, for adding your valuable experience. Thank you guys for an awesome 